Okay, solar radiation. Um, of course, you, you have the sun coming down. Everyone is used to that. There are certain uh, wavelengths that are filtered out by the atmosphere that we don't get, but the longer wavelengths we do. So we have infrared, uh, the visual portion of the spectrum, and then ultraviolet A and B. Ultraviolet B is what gives us such nasty sunburns and can lead to skin cancer. Why is the solar radiation environment important? Because there are different effects on the materials and the test items. The ultraviolet radiation can cause physical damage to many materials. This is when you typically have fading. Um, you may remember this when, when people hung their sheets out because it made the sheets quite white. Okay, the sun was actually fading them and that's why they looked so bright white. You never thought about that. When I was in Italy, that no, almost nobody had a clothes dryer. You hung your clothes outside on racks and it was very easy to see the fading effect. Really? <laughs> in fact, you had to make sure, like if you had a red shirt, the red was really bad. Um, it, because I had a wooden racket that I would hang things over and you would have to make sure that the next time you hung it you hung the other side so that the back didn't fade so it was such a different color than the front. <laughs> Infrared radiation is readily absorbed and converted to heat and can cause uneven heating and severe thermal radiance. Have you ever, I'm trying to think, where would you see heat waves? Have you ever seen heat waves coming up like out of a pan on a stove? Jet engines. Jet engines, yeah, they have, have big oh, ones. That's, well, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. I don't know what that is, that's why it's eight years old. That's actually infrared what waves. When, when you see that distortion, but you can't actually see color. Oh. That's, so is that what you see on a really hot day? Mm -hmm. Yep, those heat waves are actually infrared. I yeah, and it's funny, some people are more sensitive than others. I, I am very sensitive to be, being able to see it. And in those times, I mean, I'll literally stop and, and try to figure out what the heat source is because it, it doesn't seem to make sense. This is the, what causes the mirages in the roads when you're driving up over a hill and you see a dip and it looks like the road has disappeared. That's ultraviolet rays. Mm -hmm. Although sunlight is very broadband, uh, the, like before the most of the short wavelengths never reached the Earth's surface, people that are developing satellites and anything that goes into outer space do need to test for those. But because they're filtered, most of us never have to worry about it. How do you measure it? With special pyrometers, there are pyroheliometers, um, normally pyro is in the beginning of it to be able to measure. They're calibrated in terms of energy density as opposed to time. Spectral measurements may be made with filtered pyranometers or with spectroradiometers. The filters are very important. You can't just get the sensor itself. The filter has to come with it. I've seen new filters that have cost $20,000. Okay, the, the full spectrum lights are very expensive and the filters are very expensive. So this, this can be very expensive equipment. Some of the, the heating effects, now remember this is non-uniform heating. You can have jamming or loosening of moving parts. I've even had doors that that jam, start to jam. I'm in my house all the time. Yeah. What's that? Because you have a tight tolerance on the door. When oh. the sun hits it and heats it up, part of the door will actually start to stick. Yeah, our pantry door is good for the winter, but that's not good for summer. <laughs> Weakening of solder joints and glued parts, changes in strength and elasticity, loss of calibration or malfunction of linkage devices, loss of seal integrity, changes in electrical or electronic components, and pre premature actuation of electrical contacts. You can have changes in the characteristics of elastomers and polymers, blistering, peeling, and delamination of paints, composites, and surface laminates applied with adhesives such as radar absorbent material. Believe it or not, 
Kevlar can be damaged if you leave it out in the sun too long, even though it's got some type of cloth or something over it. The Kevlar itself will, will stop having the, the same protective quality as it had before. So if, if you have to wear a Kevlar vest for some reason, you want to make sure to store it out of the sunlight. So don't just take it off and throw it on the ground or something. Pressure variations. The, this can easily happen, and again, it's because of their non-uniform heating. Sweating of composite materials and explosives and difficulty in handling. I, in Turkey, now it's, it's a higher elevation, but I had my cell phone, not, not this one, but the one I had at the time, and I had it just sitting on the table. And after five minutes, I went to pick it up, and it was so hot that I almost couldn't. I actually dropped it back down for a second and I thought, no, I really have to pick it up. It's amazing how quickly the sun can heat something up. In a defense example, there was a Humvee going up into the mountains in Afghanistan. And the soldier had put his, his rifle on the dashboard so he didn't have to hold it. And snipers started to fire at them as they were going up. And he had to grab his rifle and couldn't because it was too hot. Solar radiation is more noticeable up in the mountains. It's because the atmosphere is thinner, okay? So it ties in with altitude. I got sunburn through blue jeans going down the Colorado River. Yeah, I wrote an article a couple weeks ago about clothing protection and said it was they compared to SPF like 10 or, I was relatively low, seven, eight, something wasn't very hot. And I thought, really? Yeah. yeah, I mean, blue jeans have a tight weave. I never would have guessed it could happen. So it, it sometimes you actually have to experience things like that before you believe it, because it, it sounds so unbelievable. Yeah. So the, the difficulty in handling, in some cases, would be very important, especially if it's something needed for maintenance, mm -hmm. for instance. Yeah, although this isn't related to solar radiation per se, we do have to monitor the skin temp of our fans to verify that you could still touch them, you know, they're operating at certain temperatures. Now, actinic effects, uh, which goes along with UV, um, it causes things like fading of fabric, checking and fading of paints. Checking is when it starts to make little cracks. Deterioration of natural and synthetic elastomers and polymers caused by photochemical reactions initiated by shorter wavelength radiation. If you want a good example of all of this happening, think of older cars with sun coming through the window. You have cracked dashboards that are faded. You know, you can see actually on the front panel that it's a different color. You may have a cracked steering wheel. I've had cracked steering wheels from the sun. Um, so it's, it's like you can see all of these just by thinking of an older car. The newer ones have more protection because they coat the windows to, to help block the UV. But the older cars, you would have all of these issues because the, the glass actually magnifies the, the sun coming through. A typical solar radiation test facility, you use some type of a cabinet or a chamber you need to have a solar lamp bank. Now there are two different styles of lamp. One is basically for heat. The other is full spectrum. There are two basic solar tests. One is for non-uniform heating. The other is for the rays to, to find out what's going to happen with the ultraviolet rays shining on something since they tend to deteriorate more. For the cycle, typically you follow what is in one day unless you want to find out quickly how the ultraviolet's going to affect something. Then it's typically uh, 20 hours on, four hours off. You know, you just flip the switch there on, right there, there's no ramp. And if you do that for a week, there's no guarantee of how, how long that is in the real world because you don't know where your item may be going but a week of that should at least show up weaknesses. When you do the radiation source from the lamp, temperature-wise, do you? You may actually have to cool your chamber yeah, to so make sure it doesn't overheat. And or provide a different medium mechanism. 
keep it being called. But I know it goes together. So. Yes, and, and that that's one of the, the things a lot of people forget when they're doing the, the full light range, it, the full spectrum, is that it will create heat as it's going, and it's not a heat test per se. The item may be operating, which will add more heat, so you have to find a way to get that hot air out of there, which is basically the blow cold area. You do need to make sure that your lamps are approximately one meter or three feet away from anything that's under them. Now, in this case, this is another one where a very low portion of the chamber should be used, normally about 20%. I actually have a photo of a vehicle that's been pulled into a drive-in bay. I don't know how they did it because the person would have to basically stay in it because the tolerance is so close. There's no room to open a door. And the lamps are about a foot over the top of it. That is an improper setup. Okay, now I'm sure they got done with the test and said, oh look, we did the test. But that, that is not a proper setup. You can actually calculate or adjust if you need to, but typically you use the full 1120 watts per meter squared that you're supposed to because that is considered worst case for the sun. Your radiation sources, um, are, so it's the solar radiation, it's basically lights with with protectors around them, reflectors. Because when you have a light, it goes out in all directions. If you have the light, and you have, basically it's a piece of metal that's bent around most of it, then that can help direct it out into one position. Sometimes the xenon arc or mercury xenon arc are used. There are different types of high pressure sodium vapor, you can use whatever type it takes to get the job done. If the sun spectrum is not required, then you can use things like metal halide lamps, tungsten filament lamps. The thing you really have to watch for when you use full spectrum lamps is even after just the first time they've been used, they will degrade. And you may have to, before you put the next test item in, you may have to verify that they are actually still full spectrum. So you'll have to use your sensor to find that out. That's the shame of it, is not only are they expensive, but they deteriorate with every use. Carbon arc lamp? Or, uh, to make them in the size? I, I always think of sure slots. <laughs> or old film, you know. Well, the, be, because some of what's tested is vehicles. So, you know, it, it, it can range from anything. I could solar radiate my oh, house. I'm just wondering how you, how you, they're available, you buy them, what, I, just, I wasn't sure on that time. Yeah, you just buy them from whoever makes them. This is actually a hazard, is all of these lights explode easily. Okay, a light bulb doesn't just crack, it becomes glass shrapnel. So you have to be very careful if you go in to one of these chambers, which people do even though they're warned not to. It actually creates ozone in the chamber. And so you need to be very careful of that. You can get sunburn. My, my best friend in the climatic world is, he, he's my poster child for what not to do. He tells me, stop telling people this. I said, don't worry, I'll just say your name. <laughs> He's, he's balding and he goes into the solar radiation chamber in order to adjust something. It's a, a very large chamber and he burns the top of his ears, the top of his head, the tip of his nose, and if his arms are exposed, of course, part of his arms. So what he did to overcome this problem was he bought a pile of straw hats with wide brims <laughs> that he has outside the chamber so that if somebody has to go in, they can st stick on one of these hats. Good idea. Um, you need to wear specialized sunglasses, not ones that you pick up at the pharmacy, but the style more like what welders would have to wear in order to protect your eyes. Because the, the, the source is so close, it would be like staring at the sun that, that, that is that close to you. So... Essentially welding, carbon, 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 essentially welding. Yeah. 
So you do need to be very careful. Also, uh, because of the heating effects, there can be harmful fumes that are being released from the product. Have you ever, you know, people talk about that new car smell? That's off gassing. That's consumer pieces and things. Yeah. Well, I'm going to get the carpet. Yeah, because a lot of people have, have a, a hard time really picturing what off gassing is. That, that's the easiest way to think of it, is that new car smell. Um, that can happen during testing. Okay, the, the molecules could be released, and you may not know in advance are those harmful or not. So this is, is the basic chart that it is used with a lot of them. Ultraviolet now it has been broken into A and B in most of the charts. It just shows the bandwidth of the ultraviolet, the visible, and the infrared. The tolerance you can see is different. You have a 35% plus or minus tolerance for the ultraviolet for ultraviolet A. That, that's, I have never seen that high a percentage of tolerance on anything else. But it's only 10% in the visible light range. So we talked about this. Thermal gradients occur when you have uneven heating. They have this problem on the space station because it, it always has a sun side and a dark side. That, that stay the same because of the way it's going. Um, the, the issue is they have a, a large gasket where the space shuttle comes up and docks. And the top of the gasket is in the sun. So it's very hot, you know, it, it becomes more supple, and the bottom part of the gasket is always in the dark. And because of that, because of the uneven heating, the properties are so different in the same piece of gasket that when the space shuttle comes up to attach it typically takes a minimum of three tries mm -hmm. and the man from nasa that told me this he said you'll never hear this in the news you know that they'll talk about oh the space shuttle docked they don't want to tell people it takes three tries and i guess one time it took six or seven before they could do it and it was all because of the unheated uh, uneven heating in that gasket so it, it can have a major effect. I thought it was whatever movie it was, docked. You know, you think, you know, I just docked the, the, the whole thing shut. I was doing this. <laughs> so you think every seal and every movie was getting exercise. The movie Gravity yeah. it shows a, a lot of stuff. Um, it's It was amazing to me because I, I've seen like simulators on the ground. But to actually see a person in it and realize how much is actually in these capsules, just like in a cockpit. I mean, there is a lot of equipment. And when I was checking on the different pressure regions in the aircraft, I didn't realize in the electronics phase how many, I, I mean, it's just rack after rack of what looks like LRUs. They have to be line replaceable units. And so these boxes that apparently you could just pull out and plug another one in. But it, it was it was amazing to me, all of the electronics that have to be held in that bay. You know, it's kind of funny too, you think, well, hello water is the way, but we're perfect willing to wire it, we should see the video. <laughs> yes. It's funny that it, the cell phones really didn't last that long, the in-seat phones. Oh, no, yeah, that was... And then they faded out right away. Now, I actually saw one in a recent flight. I flew to Turkey and back, and, and one of the aircraft actually still had them, but I, I was surprised. Um, some of the aircraft now, they have screens that are like this big. It's amazing, and the quality is very good. Uh, the electronics that are on aircraft are, are just overwhelming. Overawing, it's hard to believe they can do that. Yeah, I don't know. It's I just always get a kick out of you know. It's, it's fun to sense on some of the junction box. Every every seat that you can kick, you can bang, and you can break. You know, what, why, why would they choose that location? <laughs> Short break. You know, whatever, but apparently not. Now, just as a reminder, um, when you have when you're running a solar test, 
forced air circulation may have to be included, especially if you need cooling to keep the, the proper temperature because the heat lamps will heat things very hot and the full spectrum lamps are the ones that you especially need to be concerned with. So you need to make sure that you're at least one foot from any wall and at least 30 inches from the radiation source. You, if you're testing more than one unit, you have to make sure that they are separated because if they're too close together, they can actually start to shade each other. Reasonable control of the temperature <laughs> must be maintained. It, it is harder in a case like this to, to keep to a very tight tolerance. So in most cases, you are allowed more of a tolerance during this testing. So this is, you, you can either simulate the effects of cyclic and directional heating, which simulates exposure in, open, in the open and in hot climates. You, you need to decide upfront, do I do a high temperature test or do I do this solar test? Mm -hmm. And it's all based on would this ever be in a situation where it has non-uniform heating? If it does, you can actually use this to replace the, the high temperature test. If it would be in a situation where it would never get non-uniform heating, then you typically would not have to do this one, but can rely only on the high temperature test. These are, are this is a rare example of when you can trade one test for another. Now, you can't trade anything for the actinic because this is the only way you can do it, is with the full spectrum lamps. Both of the tests can be tailored to specific equipment usage environments. What I don't like is some of the specifications actually allow you to use 700 um, watts per meter squared instead of the full 1120. Now, that would basically be assuming that there was always a slight cloud cover and or a fog. Why did they do that? I'm not completely sure because I, I it's an IEC document, but I wasn't there for the writing of it. Uh, um, I, I think that they are assuming that there are a lot of cloudy days in that area because it's based on different places in the yeah. world. Or there was one country who didn't quite meet it, so. <laughs> Yeah. They went to ask for cloudy days. I still would not trust that because the sun's rays are brighter than that. You know, so that if I got one like that, I would want to tailor it to the full 1120. That's interesting because I feel like sometimes on cloudy days you can get more sun than You can, that's what they say. Part of it's because you're not expecting it, so you may stay outside longer. Oh, yeah, yeah. okay, so not necessarily that anything is for sure, just your yeah. expectation. If you were out for half hour, half hour, probably you know, not so much, but you know, you're not knowing it, so there's no protection, you didn't bother, but you're in there for four. Uh, yeah. More duration than that. Yeah. That would be my guess. Yeah. So if your test specification checklist, things that, that you should be looking at, what it should be the test item configuration and orientation relative to the light source, and this should be real world, mm -hmm. okay? If I've got a Jeep, I'm not going to flip it upside down, okay? I'm going to have it in position. The light source characteristics, the spectral content and intensity, what are the time and details of each performance check? Now, there are times when someone actually has to walk into the chamber to do the performance check, mm -hmm. like possibly getting into the vehicle to turn on the engine or something. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I've had, a, in Texas one time, I left the, the windows closed. I used to swear I would never go back to Texas in August, and every August somebody would want me down there. But I tried to turn on the ignition, and I actually had tears rolling down because it hurt so much, but I knew if I let go that the car wouldn't start. Mm -hmm. And this is just from the solar radiation coming in. So you would want to make sure with something like that, the automotive people do it all the time, 
they're actually testing the inside, but the light has to come through the windows because it reacts differently than if they just tested with the, if they took the top of the car off. Mm -hmm. You need to know um, what type of visual examinations you're planning on doing. Photographs are very good, especially if you're looking for faded, because you may not see it so much with the, the just by eye. Uh, you know, if you're looking at it every day for seven days, it may look the same. Mm -hmm. But with photographic evidence, then you may see differences. You need to know where your temperature sensors should be. In this case, one has to be on the item for most specifications mm -hmm. because you need to know the highest reaction. So that, that's what you're looking for. So if you have a heat producing source, here's my little heat producing source, I want it near that because that's going to be my highest response point on the item. Now, you're not controlling to that, you're measuring that. And the test item temperatures, because I can have other sensors on here checking to, to see what the temperature is, and the exposure period. The object is to, to determine the effects of solar radiation on the item. And it, it's assumed it's at ground level. Now, remember, there's big differences in the ground. So if it's something that needs to go worldwide, you may also want to test at an altitude high enough that you would be in the mountains because aircraft lands in the mountains too. Okay, and you may build one of your things. Well, yeah, you know, there, I mean, there are you know, all over, it's just a matter of where, but I don't know if there's an altitude issue, but yeah, I mean, obviously different. Well, the, the, the you, you might not have any problem with the altitude at all. You might have more of an issue with the sun's rays. Yeah, there's yeah, then it's just a different value of. It's partly that, that as you get higher up, there isn't as much altitude to filter out the UVB rays. Yeah, plus the warming effect increases. So do you change the bolts that you're using in your test to mimic that, or what, what do you do? In your the, 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 the same bulbs. Um, the, the main issue typically in a case like that would be the, the extra heating that you're going to have. Because things will heat up faster in the mountains because of the thinner air. If the sun is shining. But you could duplicate that in time. I mean, yes. You know, just changing the change time frame. So, well, talk about as soon as I control the light. I mean, if you don't mind. If it's mountain and you know it's higher energy than it, and you do, you do it for a longer period to compensate for that. Yes, you, you could do it like that because it, it's going to be an additive issue. You know, how, how much has this actually gotten? And it doesn't have to be all in one stretch. And usually, cables are covered, or thumb but sometimes they're covered. Normally, outside, it's bus work and things like that, so it's not. But in some cases, they do run uh, insulated cable as a bus work. And sometimes covered, sometimes not. Now, one thing to think about when you're doing a solar test is whether or not you want to add humidity. Do you think there's ever humidity when the sun is shining? No. <laughs> See, a lot only, of people want to leave it out. <laughs> um, the, it all happens independently in controlled environment. Yes, which one comes first? <laughs> so you can see how these all start to add together, and you, and you can't say, okay, this came first, because they're all there. Uh, there may be times when it's very important to test with humidity as well, especially if you know that your item may be in a very humid area that also has a lot of direct sunlight. Okay, so that may be an important additive to your test. So basically you want to make sure it's raised up off the bottom, just like, like in any temperature test. You're going to want to make sure that there is airflow, and part of that airflow may be cooling if you need it, especially during the, the uh, second test. Um, and then you want, to, <laughs> you want to make sure it's fully exposed. Here it says the preferred test duration shall be 3, 10, or 56 cycles as appropriate. This is from an international standard. Most standards will tell you 
how many cycles you need to do. Um, no standard 810 uses seven. I don't remember what DO 160 uses. And they admit that even after the seven, okay, that would be roughly one week, after those seven cycles. Oh, so talking, you're talking a day cycle time frame. Okay, yeah. not as smart here. So it's a, a one cycle is one day, okay, to, to follow the sun. There's no way of saying how long that can last because there are cloudy days. It's all accumulation of the rays. But at least it gives you an idea of what may be a weakness and may have issues with that. I know he opened the door, but we're almost done. So, <laughs> um, this is a different spectral energy distribution and permitted tolerances chart. Now this time, instead of the 35% tolerance under ultraviolet A, it's under ultraviolet B. Invisible, you've got 10, 10, 10, and then infrared, it's plus or minus 20. A lot of this is because of the lights. It's very hard to get full spectrum lights that can do everything that you need them to do. And like I said, they're um, ex expensive. This is one solar radiation test, and this is basically trying to follow a day. Okay, so you know you, you start out at 25 degrees, and again they're assuming that you're going up to, to 55 degrees, or in this one you have the option of going to 40 degrees if it's a cooler day. You keep bringing up your peak until the noon period, basically, and so you keep your, your peak for four hours and then you bring it back down, and then you have four hours of complete off time. Mm -hmm. So th this is, is one example. Others are, are very similar to this. Is, in this case, is the cycling important? Yes. Just from the thermal expansion and that sort of thing? Yes, okay. because this one is, is supposed to follow the heat during the day that you would see. Th this is not the one with the infrared, so you don't oh. need the full spectrum lights mm -hmm. for this. You could, but you don't have to, according to most specifications. This is the one where you need the full spectrum lights because you're looking for actinic effect. You are off for two hours, or well, this one has you gradually going up. I've seen others where it just has a sharp knee. You just you go up immediately. You have your irradiation period of 20 hours. You're off for four hours, and then you continue to repeat this. This. This one, you just basically turn it on and leave it on for as long as you feel is necessary. Mm -hmm. You don't have any dark period at all. Mm -hmm. All right, and that is it for this chapter. Don't you feel proud of yourselves for getting through this? I'm proud of you. <laughs>